All right, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for getting up and getting down here in time for our talk. Um, I barely made it myself, so I understand the struggle that was involved. Uh, my name is Tom Cross, uh, and this is Colin Anderson, and um, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the new uh, export controls that are proposed for intrusion software. Um, um, I guess we. Uh, I was going to start with a quick background for for both me and Colin. I I. Um, um, I uh, used to work for Internet Security Systems, where I did a lot of um, I did a lot of export control work. Um, I helped uh, um, the company understand what it was that we were making and how the export control uh, rules applied to the things that we made. Um, and I helped uh, the lawyers uh, communicate with the government about that. Um, in addition, I did a lot of vulnerability research work and managed vulnerability researchers. And so uh, I know a lot about vulnerability disclosure, and um, you know I can see. Uh, some of the consequences that the regulations may have for researchers. Uh. Sure. I'm Colin Anderson. I'm a network researcher based in Washington, D.C. I've done a lot of work on looking at the structures of network controls, uh, patterns of network performance, and especially as they're applied to issues such as Internet censorship. Uh, being in, in D.C., uh, which is a, a scarce place for people with a technology background, that's also afforded uh, some interaction with the policy uh, landscape. And so as a result, for the past five years or so, I've looked at issues that are sort of rolled up under the umbrella of Internet freedom, uh, including things like uh, circumvention tools, uh, uh, anonymity online, and uh, in addition to export controls and sanctions on the flow of uh, basically surveillance and censorship goods. So <clears throat> I... Um you know, <clears throat> I knew that uh, that that this um, that this stuff was coming down the pipe. Um, you know, months ago when the DEFCON <clears throat> call for papers opened, uh, and um, it was something that concerned me. I knew that the United States government was going to implement it at some point. I didn't know when, um, and uh, you know, I, I felt like it was an, it was something that the community needed to understand better. And I ended up having a conversation with Colin about it. He's one of the few people who was writing about this before the United States uh, decided to publish their implementation. Uh, he wrote a really good paper um, discussing uh, the controls and what they were and were not intended to do. Um, and so, um, you know, in t discussing it with them, you know, we decided to uh, propose a talk here because we, you know, we felt that these issues were relevant to this community. The community needs to understand them. Um, the uh, and then subsequently. The United States published their implementation, I think it was in May, um, and uh, opened a public comment period. And so everybody in the InfoSec industry like, sort of suddenly got involved in this topic. And a huge number of comments were filed to BIS. And the window for filing, the original window to file comments closed just before uh, DEF CON. So, uh, um, you know, a lot has happened. Um, Colin may be one of the few people on the planet who's actually read every single comment that was filed. I, I don't know if BIS has read every single comment that was filed. Um, uh, um, you know, there is going to be a second round of this. There's going to be a revised regulation and another opportunity for us to comment. And so what's important is that everybody in the community understand what's going on and be engaged and provide constructive input. Uh, to, to BIS um, so that they don't screw this up. Um, and they're going to they're gonna ask for our input again. Um, so, uh, you, know, um, the, the, you know, the question that uh, we have kind of a, a sarcastic title here, the Western Arrangement on Export Controls for Conventional Arms and Dual-Use Goods and Technologies and You. Um, the, uh, the, 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 one of the things we wanted to discuss with this talk is like, like, is this or is this not a threat to vulnerability research? Um, and uh, um, you know, the truth is we don't know. Um, part of the reason for that is that neither of us is an attorney, uh, and so you can't take anything we say seriously. Um, the the other thing is that the government doesn't know, um, and they've contradicted themselves on this topic, and we'll show you where. Uh, and um, in fact, nobody knows. Um, and in fact, uh, Colin and I don't even agree about it. So um, it's a messy topic, um, but uh, you know. So I mean, there's been a lot of. There's actually been two other talks at DEF CON and Black Hat about this, um, and we've heard, heard opinions from a lot of smart people about this topic. Um, what's really important is your opinion, uh, and so we want to use this hour to try to arm you to 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 develop your own point of view about this, um, as opposed to necessarily just hearing ours. Um, I, I I do want to show you. 
um, a few of my favorite uh, comments that were submitted to BIS. Um, I didn't read them all, but I went through them, and, and I, I have a few that, that I think are, are, uh, are, are hilarious. Um, and, uh, and so um, on the topic of like what is constructive input to BIS and what is not constructive input to BIS, we'll start with some counterexamples. Um, the first is this. Bra, make that jailbreak legal. So um, BIS does not care how many people file comments. Uh, and uh, uh, although I agree with the sentiment expressed here, it's not terribly persuasive. Um, and so it helps to have arguments along with your opinion. Um, um, the second uh, 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 favorite comment is the one that we've um, submitted. Uh, and uh, it's, um, it's, uh, he, he talks about his recent ordeal with law enforcement. Um, and, you know, there are many people who, who submitted comments that cr are critical of what BIS is trying to do. Uh, Weave's comment was one of the few that was absolutely supportive of everything that they want to implement. Uh, and he explained that he's plotting a violent overthrow of the United States government, and he's having difficulty recruiting to his cause. And so he encouraged BIS to proceed in hopes that it would, you know, drive more recruits into his, uh, you know, planned revolution. Um, you know, I, I personally, I don't often plan violent overthrow of the United States government. But when I do, I usually keep it on the DL until we're ready to roll. Um, the third um, favorite comment is from Raytheon. Uh, so I, I currently work for a company that has seven employees and we're busting our ass to get product out the door. And, and uh, I sat down and took time to write, you know, constructive commentary for BIS on this issue because I think it's a big deal. Um, the, uh, the Raytheon is a 60,000 employee uh, federal government contractor with full-time attorneys that work for them. Uh, they, they filed a single page um, in which they explained that they want an extension on the time window to comment because their dudes are on summer vacation. So th uh, this is now a new life goal for me. Um, I hope to, in my life, become so powerful uh, that uh, I can tell the Department of Commerce to hold off on a regulatory issue because I need to take vacation. Um, so, no, these, these comments are not particularly helpful, but perhaps at the end of the talk, uh, we, can, we can show you uh, the kinds of comments that, that will be helpful. Um, uh, you know, first, uh, we want to talk about, about, uh, about the basics, like, what is the problem here? Why is this even happening? And uh, for that, I'm going to turn sure. over to Colin. <clears throat> so, I probably can't come, go close to that. Yeah. So, part of the reason, I, I'm sure that Several of you have attended all three now of the presentations, and the idea is to give a common core, because we need to be able to start to speak to what the issues are, what the language is, uh, has been. And there are a lot of complexities to this issue, and in fact, I think no one's really talked about the full lead up to it, what people are trying to control, and what the language even says. There's been a lot of assumptions, a lot of hyperbole, some of it true, some of it untrue, all driven by the complexities of the, this regulation. But we should step, take a step back very briefly. The, the source of this is obvious. The reality is, is that surveillance is, is becoming an, a multi-billion dollar industry uh, provided to foreign, foreign governments used against questionable targets on a continual basis. Change slides. <clears throat> you know, no, there's no greater example of this than the hacking team incident. What you have is a company that was based in Italy that was selling both to the FBI but also despotic governments around the world without necessarily any sort of precondition on those sales. Anywhere from Bahrain, which regularly uh, uh, arrests dissidents, legitimate dissidents, to Ethiopia, to Sudan, who's under an arms control treaty. While, while Acting Team had make, made the assertion that they had sort of a human rights due diligence process, so did Finn Fisher, where we later found out that the chair of Finn Fisher's uh, ethical review committee was the CEO of, 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 of Finn Fisher himself. And so not really necessarily an independent uh, arbiter of what is a, a legitimate transaction or not. In the case of Hacking Team, while there was a Italian uh, uh, attorney who was I think very effective at actually writing out some of these issues, by and large, these, these, these recommendations were ignored. But I want to focus on one thing, which is what happened in Hacking Team especially was that Hacking Team's products were being used to compromise not only uh, legitimate targets, or rather, not only counterterrorism, 
but also legitimate d democratic activists, but not only domestic democratic activists, but actually international activists. And so there's nothing that's going to invite regulation from, uh, from, from governments more than having their own citizens being targeted by these items. So this becomes a product this becomes a product of this sort of drag of unregulated space being used in creating increasingly visible sort of breaches of, of, of privacy around the world. So much so that this became a, 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 a point in even a congressional testimony uh, from uh, intelligence officials on the sort of threats that, uh, that intelligence officials are, are, are uh, seeing online. So, I mean, I think that this is an issue that lots of people in this community care about. We don't like to see um, a surveillance technologies used by oppressive regimes. A lot of this community has to do with, with uh, fighting that on different levels. Um, uh, really, so that I, I think that most of us agree that this is bad. The, the, the question is, what is um, the best way to combat it? Um, and also, are there ways to create a rule for export control that combat it that don't also have negative consequences for other important things that we want to do? Um, you know, often creating a new regulation creates more problems than it solves, as people in this community are very familiar with. Um, so, uh, you know, what we, um, so we want to provide um, some background here. Um, you know, what is the Wassenaar arrangement? The Wassenaar Arrangement is an international agreement uh, regarding the export of dual-use items. Um, uh, um, the, the, uh, the, the, um, so let, let me explain what dual-use item is. Um, uh, we have um, agreements about the export of military goods, so you know, guns, tanks, airplanes, uh, you know, stuff like that. Um, and, you know, it, there pretty much is only one use for an aircraft carrier, and that is to have a military. I mean, you could throw a party on it, but generally speaking, people are not buying them for legitimate consumer usage. Um, uh, but there are a lot of things that, that have legitimate consumer use or business use that could be applied to a military application, but are not necessarily being sold for that purpose. And that's what a dual use item is. Um, cryptography is regulated as a dual use item. Most of us are not using it in order to uh, um, you, you know, protect uh, espionage. Um, you know, we use it to protect our web browsing, but um, you know, it could be used to protect espionage, and so it's considered a dual use item. Uh, the Wasser Arrangement is, is a bilateral agreement amongst a whole bunch of different countries, including Russia. Um, uh, th they all agree that they're not going to um, you know, allow certain kinds of commodities to be exported outside of their country, um, except in certain circumstances. Uh, so um, um, it's important to understand that there, there's two tiers here. So um, the Wasnar Arrangement agreed to some controls on intrusion software back in 2013. And all of the countries that are members of the Wassenaar Arrangement are thereby compelled to implement this agreement. Um, and so at the United States being a member is now compelled to implement an agreement. And then BIS, it's part of the Department of Commerce, is attempting to implement um, uh, this in the United States. And so there's a discussion that's happening where, where um, BIS has published their uh, suggested implementation and asked for comments about that implementation. Um, and uh, um, you know they're open to discussion about that. But having a different discussion where we say, well, let's go back and change what Wassenaar agreed to is a much more different difficult thing. It's easy for BIS to change. It's more difficult for Wassenaar to change. And that's an important dynamic in this discussion that people need to be um, uh, cognizant of. Um, There's also, to that effect, uh, one, of the thing, one of the things that's important to, to start to talk about is actually because there's, there's this, these layers, effectively what happens is Wassenaar gives a particular set of language and then it's up to the member states in order to dictate the licensing policies and so, in some ways the, the interpretations. And so they can license these things liberally or they can even decontrol as in like not require a, a, a license for a certain set of uses, but that's up to the member states. And so what we're going to talk about across of a lot of this, and, and it's important to reflect back on if you were here yesterday or any of the previous days or, or if you've read into this, there's a difference between the Vasnar language as it was written and BIS's uh, proposed control. And so we have to dissect the two because you look at things like rootkit and zero day, a lot of people have fixated on, on the use of these terms, the undefined use of these very nebulous terms, but those aren't originally in the Vasnar language. 
And so what we're going to try to do is effectively say, this is the Vasanaru language, this is what BIS has added on to it, and this is particularly, if you have concerns based off of this, the room for negotiation uh, for either having it increased or decreased, presumably decreased, uh, or having requiring or requesting uh, specific defini definitions to be added to what these mean. Like, when, they, when it comes up, there's a nebulous term, uh, carrier grade class. What is carrier grade class? If you are interested in that, recommending to BIS, this is what uh, carrier grade class is. Ex uh, you know, clarification such as that. So um, this is a picture of me at DEF CON 4. Um, wearing a T-shirt that had RSA implemented in Perl, uh, which at the time was considered a uh, was on the U.S. munitions list, um, and uh, and um, was you couldn't export it uh, outside the United States. Uh, it wasn't considered a uh, it was considered an arm, um, and uh, you know today and so. Um, uh, you, the arms, export of arms, are controlled by ITAR, which you've heard a lot about, um, and they are, uh, um, ITAR is operated by the Department of State, um, and so if you want to export something which is considered an ITAR commodity, you have to work with the Department of State in order to be able to do that. Um, dual use items are not controlled by the Department of State, they're controlled by the Department of Commerce. The reason is that commerce tends to be more friendly to business interests than the Department of State. Um, and uh, you know, encryption is is currently controlled by by the Department of Commerce and the EIR. So I just wanted to clarify that distinction because we talk a lot about ITAR in this community, um, and uh, it's important that people understand the distinction between um, the dual use items that are that are controlled by the EAR, uh, the Export Administration Regulations, under the Department of Commerce, and the arms which are controlled under the Department of State. Um, the new intrusion software controls would fit under BIS and not under Department of State. Um, so another thing that, that a lot of people think in this community is that there are no export controls on cryptography anymore. We won the crypto war. Um, and uh, you know, that's, there's, I guess it's a matter of opinion. We, we did win a lot in the crypto war, but there still are export controls on cryptography. Um, and and uh, you know, people do get um, uh, uh, um, you know, prosecuted for violating export controls on cryptography. So this example is from uh, 2014, an Intel subsidiary paid $750,000 for um, a, uh, an unauthorized encryption export. Um, so, um, you, you know, it used to be in the 90s that if you wanted to export cryptography, unless you, um, unless it, uh, you know, met certain characteristics, um, you, you, the answer was usually no. Um, and so you, you could ask the government and they would, t they would say no. Um, today, you still have to ask the government, generally speaking, um, but the answer is usually yes. Uh, and so, um, you know, that's, that's a huge distinction in terms of what we're able to do, but the bureaucratic uh, load of, of having to talk to the government about it is still there. Um, it doesn't really have a big impact on our community, though, because, um, uh, you, you know, as a consequence of a lawsuit that the, um, that the EFF filed, uh, um, the the uh, uh, Bernstein versus DOJ, um, they argued that 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 source code is speech, um, and that when you publish source code, uh, you're you're engaged in a First Amendment protected activity. And as a consequence, we have an exception for open source software called License Exception TSU, uh, which is uh, um, which allows you to uh, when you put source code out on the internet, um, uh, you know it can be exported without uh, without a license. Now you you are supposed to notify. Uh, BIS that you've done it. You're supposed to send them an email with a with a link to the place where you put the stuff online. Uh, but other than that, um, you're you're good to go. You also you also email the NSA. <clears throat> uh, so you have this uh, yeah. very dense license <clears throat> exception in C slide. In so to go back to that point, actually, uh, when we when we hear people like Matt Blaze talk, when we talk, hear cryptographers talk about sharing within within their domain. Actually, they are still controlled, but they fall under a set of license exemptions, such as what's called license exception ENC. Actually, license exception ENC is very dense and complicated, and really no one understands it. <clears throat> and to refer back to the settlement that was, that was initially talked about, the crypto rules are not generally enforced. The, the case in which there was a $750,000 fine was actually in, an Intel subsidiary, uh, Wind River, exporting to the People's Liberation Army of China. And so when they're used, they're used in these very specific cases, 
but very, very infrequently. So actually, for those of you who, for example, work on network, any sort of network communications tool uh, that employs cryptography, even if you are not shipping uh, cryptography, if you are linking to, for example, OpenSSL, you actually fall under, still, the export control regulations. However, you generally do, are not aware of this because you either fall under license exception TSU, which is technology software unrestricted, it's also called the general software note for other people who've, who've been into this. Um, but you also fall under this dense category uh, of controls. So the point of saying this, uh, talking about this is, is that when we talk about regulation, I think that we think that regulation automatically leads to the kicking down of doors. But in fact, on a daily basis, there is a regulatory landscape that you interact with that you might not necessarily be even aware of. So um, I, I, a lot of the questions that I heard like talking to people at DEF CON have to do with, you know, like uh, what is the point of having an export control on software because you can just download it, right? Um, like wh why, is, why is there an export control in cryptography when you can just, you know, download PGP? Um, and I, I, I want to address that. I think there are two um, ways in which these things function um, that are worth being aware of. The first is that um, when, when you're um, working in a company um, there's a lot of pressure to do deals. Um, so, you, you, you know, you, you get somebody who comes in and wants to buy your product, um, and the sales guy is financially incented to do the deal, and the channel partner is financially incented to do the deal, um, and, and the, the, the management team is financially incented to do the deal, and the shareholder is financially incented to do the deal, and you're this guy who stands up and says, guys, I don't think we should do this deal because the customer is threatening the national security of the United States. The answer is going to be, shut up, hippie. We have a business to run here. And so, um, you know, it, export controls work really well when people actually want to comply with them. Um, and so you, you don't want to do that deal. You don't want to do business with that guy. And, and now you can say, look, my hands are tied. I can't sell you the software. I'm sorry. I, you know, you can tell the, the sales guy and the channel partner and the management team and the shareholders, I'm sorry, but we can't do this business. Um, and, and so it puts businesses in a, in a place where they're not required to make moral decisions um, with respect to who they're doing business with. Um, and the, which can be and you, also, you also don't necessarily want a lot of these people to be making the well, moral right, decisions. Well, right, because a lot either. of them are just going to do the deal. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of pressure to do the deal. Um, and so, you know, that's, and so I, um, at, a, at a, a previous employer, we, we so um, back in the late 80s, uh, India tested a nuclear bomb, um, and as a consequence of that, the United States took a bunch of Indian government agencies and put them on what's called the denied party list. So that's a list of people you're not allowed to export things to. Uh, and, uh, um, the, you know, decades later, um, these guys wanted to buy, um, uh, you know, an IPS that I worked on. Um, and they wanted to buy it for the same reason that anybody buys an IPS. They're trying to stop malware in their network. Um, but this IPS had encryption in it because you do that. Uh, and, and so it was a controlled commodity. And we couldn't sell it to them because they were on the denied party list. They tried over and over and over again to buy it. We couldn't sell it to them. Um, the sales guys get riled up. You know, I'm trying to make Lexus payments. I'm sorry, dude. We, we, we can't do this deal. Uh, and, um, um, and then, you know, the, so in 2007, uh, the Bush administration reached some sort of agreement with the Indian government where the Indian government provided unspecified assistance on the war on terror in exchange for removing some of these entities from the denied party list. And these guys, this particular government agency in India, called us the very next day to buy the software. Um, and so, you, you know, like basically, like I'm sure that our IPS wasn't like the key to like negotiating this deal with the Indian government, right? It was, but it was on the list somewhere. It was probably pretty far down on it, but it was on it somewhere. Um, so these, these export controls, um, you know, are a mechanism that the government uses to negotiate things with other governments. It's a, it's a, it's a stick in the various uh, uh, different kinds of diplomatic things that, that the government can do to put pressure on other governments. Uh, and so um, those are the kinds of things that can happen that, that really, you know, um, you know, sure, this Indian government agency could have downloaded, uh, you, you know, stored or something, but, you know, the, the people buy commercial products for a reason. And so they, they just wanted to be able to do that. And uh, um, that, was a, that was enough to, to uh, give the United States some leverage. So um, we're going a little slow here. We want to talk about the new rules and provide you some background because nobody in the past two talks has really just sat down and explained exactly what um, is being proposed here. So um, we're going to do that. And we'll start with 
the IP network surveillance controls, uh, which are not as controversial as the intrusion software controls. Yeah. Uh, so to fly through it, because we, we don't have much time, uh, if, if you'd heard yesterday, actually, there's two controls that were, that, that were uh, for, proposed for implementation by BIS. They come from two different sources. The first is the IP network uh, surveillance systems. Actually, the origin of this uh, originates from, uh, from the French delegation to, to, to Vassenaar. And the reason why is that uh, post-Gaddafi Libya, a, bunch, uh, a number of documents were uncovered showing that their local business, uh, AMSIS, had been providing a, a sophisticated monitoring centers to to the government in order to basically you know, surveil the entirety of the, the communications infrastructure, which isn't hard when it's, when it's Libya. So they pushed, uh, they pushed a particular rule for essentially monitoring centers, uh, or rather uh, sort of correlation based off of DPI. This is a very narrow rule. And so actually, you have a lot of lines here, and they're joined with ands. And so this is very important because part of the reason of talking about this is, is that in the first conversations, a lot of people just didn't read the rules. They didn't understand it, and they took these things like IP network surveillance uh, systems, these labels, and assumed that it meant DPI more broadly. It's not. It's actually performing all of the following on a carrier class IP network, i.e. a national grade IP backbone, and... Analysis at the application layer, so layer seven on OSI, and extraction of selected metadata and application content, and indexing of that extracted data, and uh, being specially designed, that's, a, uh, that's a, a term of art, to carry out all of the following. Execution of, of, uh, of searches based off of hard selectors, so this is personally identifiable information like email addresses, and mapping out national, uh, uh, the, the relational networks, the social network mapping of individuals or groups of people. So this ends up being a very specialized piece of technology. And across all of, if you look, for example, WikiLeaks' the spy files, uh, only a few products start to fall under this framework. And they are very specialized products. And I, I wanted to, to sort of direct one thing. Vassanar doesn't necessarily, Vassanar has this idea of mass market. And what mass market says is actually, essentially, not only if you're open source, but if you're generally available for the public, we're not going to control you. And so this is, this is something that comes into play because effectively stuff that's off the shelf generally, unless it's encryption actually, uh, isn't controlled by, by the Vassanar arrangement. One of the points of controversy though is uh, BIS said this all uses crypto, so we're going to control it like, like cryptography. That's a lot of the pushback, and it's an important point that we can talk about later. But suffice it to say, uh, the, the IP network surveillance systems is very narrow and probably only uh, runs in incidentally to some, uh, I think, probably speculative uh, uh, network intrusion detection systems. So intrusion software, however, is the largest point of controversy, and, and rightfully so. So firstly, uh, the Vassanar arrangement puts together this definition of what it calls intrusion software. And it says, uh, software specially designed, there's that keyword again, or modified to, to avoid detection by monitoring tools or defeat protective countermeasures of a computer or network capable device and performing all of the following. The extraction of data or information from a computer or network capable device or the modification of user data, that's one possible route, or the modification of the standard execution path of a program or process in order to allow the execution of externally provided um, instructions. And they provide definitions on monitoring tools and protective countermeasures. I think probably people have a, a good understanding of, of what those mean, but hey, um, at least you have uh, uh, things like uh, DEP and ASLR uh, showing up in export controls. That's kind of cool. Um, so, I mean, the question is, is intrusion... Oh, right. Uh, sorry. So, uh, so here's the important point about intrusion software. Intrusion software itself is not controlled. Oh, right. That's the next slide. There are, yeah, there are no controls on intrusion software. We've defined what it is, but there's no export controls on them. Uh, and that, this is why this gets very confusing. Um, so what is controlled? Um, one of the reasons that this is super confusing is that they didn't come up with a name for the thing that is controlled. Uh, I don't know if you, sure. you want me to do this slide or you want to do it. 
Uh, well, so just to continue. So intrusion software is this definition that they use throughout the rest of the document. Intrusion software itself is not the thing that, that's controlled, but actually what they start to control is this periphery of technologies. And the reason they did this was actually pretty, pretty smart, which is they said, firstly, the biggest problem is, is if we can control, uh, this came out, by the way, uh, out of the UK delegation to Vassenar, and the reason why is because they had been, uh, uh, Finn Fisher had had uh, a presence in the country uh, enough so that they had to start figuring out how to control Finn Fisher. And what they said, firstly, is if we control intrusion software, then that means that anyone who's been hit by, by anything that's controlled, anyone who's, for example, a target of intrusion software, would be, uh, would be engaged in an export control violation if they took their infected malware outside of the country. And so what they started to say is actually, especially for things like hacking team, what you start to look at in the catalog is that there is a broader periphery of technologies that are used to support this. Fin Agent, for example, or RCS, is not necessarily DaVinci, is not necessarily a, a, a substantial thing. It's not the thing that makes the entirety of hacking team's equipment uh, valuable. And so what they said is, we're going to control the, the periphery of technologies around it. So the things that interact with it, the RCS console, uh, the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the proxy, the um, FinFly proxy, the, uh, which is the, um, basically the middle box that's doing infection by tainting binaries. Uh, we're going to control the hardware and the software that creates the, the ecosystem around that technology that is, that is necessary for the, uh, the infection and the operation of, of, the, uh, of the, the Trojan itself. Here's where it gets more confusing. They also start to do what's called technology for the development of, of intrusion software. And by and large, when you, when you run into controversy, this is probably the largest issue, which is technology in, the, in terms of Avasanar is a specialized thing. It's basically information. It's basically technical, uh, um, technical data. Uh, it's, it's technical assistance. It's blueprints. It's the structure that is necessary for the creation of that thing. Well, I mean, anyone who's done like a computer science 101 course knows how, e you know, like how easy it is to control intrusion software. And so this is the, one of the points of ambiguity that we start running into, because it's not well defined. Uh, technology is defined. Development of, uh, uh, is defined. Intrusion software is denied, de defined. But what all of these things together mean is one of the largest things that you'll see across the FAQs, across the conversations, uh, across the debate, uh, difficulty from all the parties involved really starting to be able to scope this out in a limited way that doesn't necessarily create an onerous burden for researchers like a lot of the people in the room. So, um, you know, what are the potential uh, implications of all of this? Um, and I'm going to run pretty fast because we're, we're getting low on time. Um, but, uh, you know, a big question that everyone asks is what about full disclosure or, and what about open source? Um, and uh, um, it's, it's interesting because those, a lot of us work in the encryption world and we're used to license exception TSU, which I explained before, being the mechanism through which um, you know, open source software is not controlled for export. And they specifically said that TSU does not apply to intrusion software. And so that created a lot of confusion initially because people thought, well, that means that I can't put this stuff out on the web. There's this separate um, uh, uh, um, uh, part of the regulations, um, uh, 15 uh, CFR 734.3, which uh, creates an exception for things that are publicly disclosed. Um, this exception does not apply to encryption software. And so those of us who, who work in encryption software, like, you know, we, we, we're not necessarily familiar with it, but it would apply to intrusion software. Um, so it creates exemptions for anything that's published um, you know, including on the internet, um, uh, things that arise from what's called fundamental research, which is narrowly defined, um, uh, and uh, um, things that are presented in a classroom environment in an academic institution. Um, and so, uh, you know, those are pretty broad exceptions um, that allow you to do things. And it's important that it doesn't matter whether or not your source code is open um, when you're operating under this exemption. Uh, if you can publish object code on the internet um, without publishing the source code and, and be free of control, whereas 
whereas in the encryption context, you have to publish your source code. Um, so uh, I, I figure any slide about encryption and open source software could benefit from a few pictures of Eric Raymond. Um, uh, so I, I want to explain the distinction clearly. On the one hand, uh, um, you, you know, with encryption, there's this thing called license exception TSU, and if you want to uh, want it to apply to you, you have to publish your source code and you have to email BIS and tell them where it is. Um, on the on the intrusion software side, there's this thing 15 CFR 734.3 uh, B4. It must be publicly available. It does not have to be open source, and BIS does not have to be notified. So it's a totally different system. But either way, if you're here at a con and you're talking about stuff and you're releasing stuff, you don't have to worry about export control. Um, so uh, you know the whole public sphere is kind of removed from the picture, and it's really private transactions that end up getting controlled. Um, the next question is, is what about vulnerability research? Is vulnerability research covered? When you disclose a vulnerability to a vendor, is that covered? Um, and unfortunately, that's been uh, uh, very unclear, and, and BIS has actually contradicted themselves uh, on this topic. Uh, so in, their, in the Federal Register, when they published their implementation, they had some notes that went along with it, and they said, technology for the development of, tr of intrusion software, that technology control that Colin was just talking about, includes proprietary research on the vulnerabilities and exploitation of computers. So that seems to be, you know, yes, vulnerability research is controlled. Um, then uh, BIS, after getting a lot of feedback about this, started publishing an FAQ on their website, and one of the FAQ answers says the proposed rule would not control information about vulnerabilities. Um, so you know the BIS doesn't even know what these rules um, you know mean. Uh, um, you know they also said in their fact neither the disclosure of the vulnerability nor the disclosure of exploit co code would be controlled. However, so this is the big caveat. Um, I think that the BIS has been operating under the assumption that when you disclose a vulnerability to a vendor, that all of the information that you give the vendor ends up becoming public. And so they they decided that this public. Um, uh, you know, public, the, the exception for things that are published applies here, and, and so we don't have to worry about vulnerability disclosure. But as many of you know, that's not entirely true. Often when you, when you uh, uh, disclose a vulnerability to a vendor, you include a whole bunch of technical information that, that they don't uh, subsequently disclose to the public. They put out an advisory with a little bit of information, where to get the patch, and they credit you, but they don't like publish your exploit, they don't publish your write-up that explains how you got reliable code execution. And those kinds of things, um, because they're not published, may still be technology for the development of intrusion software. So that's a real um, uh, issue here. Um, and so potentially, um, coordinated vulnerability disclosure across borders could end up being um, controlled by this uh, unless they carve out some, some pretty clear exceptions for it. Um, this could also impact bug bounties. You know, not only are you, uh, you know, coordinating this information across a border, but you're getting paid for it, and you're not talking to the vendor. Uh, directly. So, um, you know, th th that's important to point out because the, if they do craft an exception, it needs to include bug bounty programs. So, um, so this is one of the points, though, is that this is struggling to interpret the Vasanar language. And this is a point in which a large number of the people in this room have the ability to start to clarify what the intended scope of these should be, how you get to the effective point where hacking team and others might incur controls if, if, you're, you know, if you're interested in that. Where, while not necessarily creating an undue burden on the types of people in the room. This is the, this is the translation process that is necessary for the participation of, of, of those of you around. I think we need to skip to that. Yeah, so, um, the, the, uh, um, I, I, so quickly, um, one of the things they controlled is, is uh, uh, um, ways to reliably and predictably uh, um, defeat protective countermeasures because they didn't think that that was relevant to a vulnerability disclosure. But as we know, there are vulnerability disclosure programs that specifically have to do with mitigation bypasses. So, um, uh, so that's potentially an issue. Um, sharing exploit toolkit samples is potentially controlled. And their fact, they said, um, you know, exploit toolkits uh, you know, would be covered under the proposed rule and there's no um, license exceptions for them. So those of us who work in the InfoSec industry, they find these things and pass them around on, on private mailing lists so we can make sure our tools detect them. Um, you know, potentially that, that activity could be controlled, um, at least under their initial pass in, in interpreting this. Um, what about training classes? So technology for the development of intrusion software includes sitting down and talking to somebody about it. And so if you're having a, a training class, there's an exception for classes that are offered in an academic environment. Uh, 
but there's no exception for, um, uh, for, uh, for, for private training classes. So we see like at Black Hat, they've got really expensive training classes um, you know, that, are, that, are, that, uh, that, that you know, aren't, aren't available to the public. So potentially they, they could become controlled and Black Hat might have to ask you know, what country you're, you're, you're from before they let you take the class. Uh, um, traveling outside the United States. So there's a specific exemption that applies to encryption software. If it's on your laptop for personal use and you're traveling outside the United States, you don't have to worry about export control. As long as you're gonna bring it back and you're not gonna disseminate it when you're over there. Um, but they didn't apply this exception to intrusion software. So if you had Metasploit on your laptop or Core Impact and you traveled outside the United States, um, potentially you might um, uh, you know, have illegally exported the software in doing so, even if you don't give it to anybody else. Um, if you have foreign coworkers in your office um, you know, telling them about uh, uh, you know exploiting a vulnerability or giving them access to tools like Core Impact, um, you know may potentially violate the, these rules because they're foreign nationals and so it's considered an export. Um, uh, but that's also know, that's also an idiosyncrasy of the U.S. regime. That's a this notion of deemed exports is something that only uh, exists in the U.S. and that's one of the things that I think people have run into that they didn't necessarily understand. Um, uh, you know, so debuggers and exploit generators is a question that people have brought up. If it's specially designed for the generation of intrusion software, it may be controlled. Most debuggers aren't, but some are. Um, uh, jailbreaking software could potentially be subject to uh, uh, export control. Um, so, um, uh, and, and then there's this other point that, that uh, you, you know, they said they would have a policy of presumptive denial for items that support rootkit or zero day exploit capabilities. And, uh, that's way more aggressive than like the Wassenaar text itself. That's not something Wassenaar requires. That's something that the United States government is potentially interpreting. So, um, you know, I'm trying to blow through the, the rest of our slides here. I think it's important that we highlight a few comments that were submitted yeah. uh, that we think are really good. So, so we've run out of time. And this is because in, 40, in, in 45 minutes, we couldn't even get through the entire scope of the rule. It's complex, and we know it's, a, it's complex. There's a lot of resources that are available, and there are specific points that people are going to incidentally run into. A lot of these things are easily fixable, uh, as long as the right people are saying the right things. The last call closed on, on the 20th, and actually 260 comments uh, were, were filed. The vast majority of those were not broad, don't, mess with my jailbreak, they were constructive They were constructive involvements from people within the community. And so, for example, uh, Dino from Square submitted an issue, their issue with, uh, in a personal capacity, with deemed exports. And they said, actually, we work in an environment in which we have to exchange this information. It's critical. We are not, necess we are not facilitating the intrusion of users. We're trying to protect our service. We need access to deemed exports. Uh, we need to be able to, to provide it to foreign nationals within our office. So Dino's comment is good because he talks about what he's doing, he explains why it's legitimate, he explains how it interacts with the, with the regulation and why the regulation might prevent him from doing it. And he provides example after example after example. That level of specificity is influential to BIS because they don't know what goes on in your world and they, they need to understand how they could potentially negatively impact it. So in another case we have uh, actually the New York Electrical Power Association. Uh, at some point, they realized, wow, we have pen testing tools and we have foreign nationals and we have, uh, we have international companies that need to be able to export within other branches. And this is a great example because what they said is, uh, we need to know about bulk export licenses. We need to know about you know, whether it's possible for you to exempt certain countries that are not necessarily going to engage in, in malicious hacking of, of dissidents or intelligence uh, uh, targets. We need to know about how we can better interact with foreign offices and subsidiaries. We need to, to make sure that we can facilitate legitimate research within our company. And they started to lay out these specific points, yet again, that spoke to their interest and also the interest of BIS and basically the federal government to protect the power grid. I thought actually one of my favorites was Cobalt Strikes. Cobalt Strike wrote through paragraph by paragraph on saying, we need to be able to do this. We are a legitimate business. This is our this is our involvement, and this is how we interact with the economy. And so they went through paragraph by paragraph. They had recommendations. They had support. They articulated their argument in order to address the specific claims. They had specific things that they were interested in fixing 
uh, or that they needed to be protected. They don't necessarily have to endorse the rules. You don't necessarily have to endorse the rules. You can think that export controls are the, are, are the bane of their existence. They're futile, that you'd have to erect a, a, a great firewall. I will disagree with you, but uh, the likelihood, you know, f you have to behave politically, essentially, and you have to say, irrespective, we disagree with these rules, we disagree with them on this basis, and this is the basis in which we want to protect our assets, so that we want to protect our, our legitimate activities, and so this is what you have to do. They want information. They did not have to open up this call. By, based off of the, the process, Rapid7 did this again. Rapid7 said, this is our, our, our involvement with, with the industry. And so this is the point in which Biz came to, to DEF CON. They want your input. There's going to be a second proposed rule that will come out in the next couple of months. They, there's technical advisory committees. Uh, they have maintained an open door. And then this is the opportunity for you to be able to pr protect your profession. There you go. All right, so I'm sorry we don't have time for questions. Um, it, uh, it's early and it took it's us a little bit of uh, time to get up to speed here, but I really appreciate your uh, interest this morning and uh, Colin and I will be uh, hanging out uh, if you want to come up and talk to us. Thank and you. And tell me why.